Welcome, Barbara. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us. We at West Bergen Mental Health Care are so proud of our partnership with Valley Hospital. Um, we do a number of these programs for uh, the Valley constituency, and we will continue to do so because I think um, it's just an important mission for us to provide education, um, information, hope and healing to all who may have questions or may be struggling or know someone who is struggling. Um, for, those of the, for those of you who may not be familiar with us, West Bergen Mental Health Care is a community mental health agency. We've been in the uh, community since 1963. Um, we provide a vast array of therapeutic services for children, adolescents, families, and adults. Um, we also operate group homes for chronically mentally ill residents who have primarily been hospitalized at some point in time. So we really offer a large um, amount of services for those in the community. Uh, again, as a nonprofit, we make sure that income barriers should never be any sort of limitation to providing therapy or receiving services. So we uh, have a sliding scale fee payment system, which means that you pay for what you can afford. Uh, so that is something as a nonprofit that we seek um, a lot of support in the community to help us provide that sliding scale fee payment system. Uh, we have three locations. One which both Barbara Krug and I are at right now, our home office at 120 Chestnut Street in Ridgewood, uh, one right next door at 140 Chestnut Street, and then our Center for Children and Youth, which is in Ramsey. Um, we are really, really pleased to be with you here today. Uh, Barbara Krug is an incredibly skilled uh, clinician who has been with us for a number of years. Uh, she has a very, very extensive practice. Uh, she works with children, she works with adults, she works with families. Um, you are all going to be in very good hands and she'll provide you more information if you would like to uh, get more information about West Bergen or feel that you would like to uh, reach out to us privately. So that information will be on Barbara's program. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our therapist, our staff therapist, Barbara Krug. Hi, I am so excited to be here today. I love speaking about anxiety um, because it's just something that's so around us right now and stress, I feel, especially because of the area we live in, this New York, New Jersey metro area, you know, between traffic and having to wait on lines and all the different things that are around us that sometimes we just feel overwhelmed or stressed. And sometimes it's a little bit more. So I'm going to share my screen and this way you have a little bit of a reference to some of the PowerPoint that I'm doing. It's gonna just take me a quick moment. Technology and I are not always the best of friends. And definitely please, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the q and I would love to take them afterwards. So as we know today, our topic is calming the anxious mind. And we do have some goals for our presentation. So what I would love for you to come away from this presentation with is an understanding of where our anxiety response comes from biologically. How is this happening? Why is it happening? What are some of the signs and symptoms of anxiety? And what are some of the strategies so that I can have something tangible to use when I'm feeling that my stress or my anxiety is increasing? I want you to feel comfortable being able to implement some of these coping strategies and to be able to manage these feelings at home. And of course, to also to be able to identify if there is maybe something more, maybe some type of underlying anxiety disorder, or maybe just a point where your stress has become so big that we need a little extra support and may need to seek some help or assistance. And I have some contacts for you for that as well. So what exactly is stress? When we think about it, you know, so often we say, oh, I'm, I'm feeling stressed, I'm feeling overwhelmed. We know it when we feel it, but when we boil it down, what stress really is, is it's that feeling of tension. It can be emotional, it can be physical, or it can be both. And it stems from a reaction to maybe a change or different demands on us or challenges that we may see, obstacles that may be part of our life. Stress is a very normal part of life. It becomes concerning when it starts to interrupt our daily functioning. 
it can definitely be positive. When I discuss the idea of stress with the middle schoolers or the high schoolers I work with, they always look at me and they're like, what do you mean? Stress positive? But stress can definitely be a positive. We want to think there about like different deadlines. It's a motivator to help us plan. And of course, any of us who have ever been through a big positive life event, whether it's planning a wedding, planning for children, planning for grandchildren, planning a trip, we know that there's definitely stress involved. It comes from our thoughts. It comes from our body. It comes from our environment. So there's so many different places that the stress can come from. And we have five typical responses to our stress. We have our subjective feelings. Am I feeling overwhelmed? Am I feeling scared? Am I feeling nervous? We have our physical symptoms. We're going to go a little bit into that, but some off the top of my head right now is stomach ache, headache, spinning thoughts. We can respond in a way where perhaps we engage in some more unhealthy habits. I know for myself, it becomes like a carb addiction. I like to drown my stress in bagels, pizza, pasta, cake, all those delicious things. And it also can lead to a decline in our performance. So think about if we're feeling overwhelmed and we have so much we need to get done and, oh, I'm going to get it all done, but we may not be getting things done to the best of our ability. It also can affect the interpersonal relationships around us. There may be an increase in conflict with others because perhaps our patience level has gone down. Perhaps it's harder for us to communicate. It may be that last thing that pushes us to a point from feeling overwhelmed to feeling really irritated and agitated and frustrated. And it can also lead to a decrease in satisfaction just in our, our general life. Why am I not having the same satisfaction I might have when I do self-care, such as maybe I want to read a book, maybe I want to go out and walk in nature, and I'm not finding the satisfaction that I used to, or even worse, maybe I'm feeling guilt that I'm engaging in self-care when I have all this other stuff going on and I need to be able to focus on it. So as I was saying before, there are positive effects of stress. And so we're going to talk about this just very briefly and then move on into a little bit more in depth. The positive effects of stress is that one, it does keep us alert. We know that that stress response that comes out, gives us some adrenaline, helps us to focus. But when it gets too big, that's when we kind of lose that focus and we feel like our thoughts are spinning. It keeps us motivated. If I'm planning a trip, I have a little bit of stress that maybe I need to have enough money to go on the trip. The trip. So maybe I need to work a little bit harder. I need to plan to make sure that my flights are going to connect the way I need them to connect. Um, I feel motivated to do the packing. Packing's not necessarily fun, it's stressful, but I know that there's a reward at the end. So it keeps us motivated to get things done and it keeps us ready to avoid and or conquer. So I always say like, this is like the superhero effect of stress. I can take it and I can become a warrior and I'm going to attack this big project I have at work. Or I tell them, again, my students, I'm going to attack this test because I'm feeling stressed about math, but I know I've studied, I was motivated to study and I'm ready, I'm ready to take it on. So there are definitely some positives to stress. We wanna think about when the stress lasts, however, and we have this prolonged exposure to it, whether it's a positive stress, whether it's a stress that is becoming overwhelming and more of a negative stress, we need to understand that it needs a break. We can't go in this stress mode eternally, right? It needs to stop at some point because when there is that prolonged exposure and we are stressed and faced with those situations, our body starts to activate our hypothalamus. Our hypothalamus, is our brain's alarm system. It's like, hey, something's going on. We need to assess what's going on around us. And what it does is it releases the cortisol, it releases the adrenaline, and that triggers our fight or flight response. So this goes all the way back to, you know, say caveman times. And if I was faced with a woolly mammoth, my brain might be like, okay, well, here's a woolly mammoth. What are you going to do? He's bigger, he's furrier, and he's got those really long tusks. Am I going to fight the woolly mammoth? Am I going to run away as fast as I can from that woolly mammoth? And what 
my brain then does is release the cortisol, release the adrenaline. So I have either that super strength, though I don't think I'm taking on the woolly mammoth, or I can run really fast away from him. So you do have a physical reaction. So when you feel stress in your body, it is a true and real thing. The stress passes, those chemicals turn off. And what happens is our body returns to normal. Our blood pressure goes down, our heart rate goes down, and we're back at our baseline, wherever it was that we started from. The problem happens is if we're facing prolonged stress or if our stressors start coming one after the other after the other and there's no break in them, because then those hormones are just kind of on hyperdrive and they keep going and our fight or flight system stays on. And that can lead to that idea of hypervigilance, the feeling that I'm always keyed up. And that can be a really uncomfortable feeling. And what happens when we have this stress and we don't have any relief from it, it becomes distress. And what that does is it affects us physically and emotionally. So here I just have some of the physical symptoms that can happen. Our equilibrium can be disturbed. So it is a real thing. If you're feeling really anxious or you're feeling very overwhelmed, you might feel dizzy. And that's an absolutely true feeling. You may find you have some digestive issues. You may be more prone to headaches. Your blood pressure goes up. It can lead to heart disease, sleep disturbance. And now it becomes a cycle because that sleep disturbance can lead you to feeling more overwhelmed, more anxious, and more stressed. All this can then lead to weight gain, weight loss. So weight gain may be the idea of I can't make time to exercise. I am picking up some unhealthy eating habits or weight loss. I've completely lost my appetite. I'm having digestive issues from being feeling this way. And so now I'm losing weight. And of course, memory and attention problems. And when this happens, this can be really scary feeling. The idea like, oh, why am I dizzy? Or why is my head hurt? What's going on with my body? I can't remember things the way that I used to remember them. Oh my goodness, is something wrong? And so what this does, now, our stress is leading us to more stress and more of those feelings of anxiety and feeling scared and overwhelmed. Emotionally, when we have this distress, it leads to these feelings of anxiety, which can also lead to feelings of depression, can lead to panic attacks, which we're going to go a little bit more into, and it can also lead to obsessive compulsive disorders. So as we said, stress without relief is distress, and that's linked to the six top causes of death. So these include heart disease, cancer, lung ailments, different accidents, cirrhosis of the liver, and unfortunately, suicide as well. It can also wreak havoc on our immune system. So something that we've been trying, especially for the past two years, to really boost our immune systems, to really keep them strong. But if we're feeling stress and we're not having relief from that stress, it's starting to wreak havoc on that immune system. And you may find like, oh, you know, I've got a little bit of a cold or why, why am I, you know, feel like I'm getting sick more often than I used to. And it can really, be and come from that emotional state of stress wreaking havoc on our body. So again, when we're talking about those physical symptoms, there are definitely some warning signs because stress does wear our body down physically. So as we said before, there's that dizziness feeling. There's a depersonalization, which I find to be one of the most uncomfortable feelings. It's almost like you're detached and I'm going to say, and this is going to sound really strange, almost like you're detached from your eyes. Like you're seeing things happen in front of you, but your brain is just not linking into it. It either feels very dreamy or like you're just completely out of it and watching yourself participate in your life without having that connection to it. You can feel general aches and pains. And that includes the headaches and there might be jaw tightness and grinding of the teeth, which is also going to lead more to the headaches. We hold so much tension within our jaw. There may be that increase or the loss of appetite as we discussed before. Definitely muscle tension. Again, thinking through our jaw, we're going to hold it really into our neck, into our face, into our shoulders. And we may not even realize it. We might have problems sleeping. We could suffer from fatigue and exhaustion, some trembling, some shaking, weight gain, weight loss, upset stomach. As we were talking about the digestive issues, diarrhea, indigestion, and acid reflux symptoms, and sexual difficulties. And again, all of this, we can start thinking and being like, oh man, what's going on? Is there something more at play? What I think is important when it comes to these warning signs is to also understand what a panic attack is. 
If anybody's ever felt a panic attack before, you know it is a really, really scary feeling. I always like to say, you know, make sure if you think you're having these feelings and it's something new, please make sure you see your doctor as well to rule out anything physical. But a panic attack really can throw you in how you feel. So it is your heart beating out of your chest, like almost like that cartoon character when the cartoon character falls in love and they, you see their heart flying out of their chest. That's what it can feel like. But it can also feel like just a really elevated heart rate. So those different types of heart palpitations, maybe a flutter as well. You get a feeling of doom. The, this is horrible, something terrible is about to happen idea. Uh, the natural thought in a panic attack is I must be dying which again is why if it's the first time you have one, it's so important to get checked out medically. Sweating, trembling, shaking, the breathing becomes shallow. There's a shortness of breath. You might feel like something is actually reaching across your throat because you get very tight in your neck area and you might feel like you can't breathe, like you're being strangled. And then that depersonalization or that dreamlike state. And of course, a feeling of losing control. If you do suffer from panic attacks and already know that you have them, it's really important to see if you can make yourself aware of when a panic attack is coming on. The reason for this is if you can enact coping skills within the first few minutes, if you feel those first symptoms, you can significantly shorten the intensity and the duration of your panic attack. One of the more interesting things I have found in my research on panic attacks is that the longer they are, the less intense they are, and the shorter they are, the more intense they are. So sometimes it's, you know, a 15 minute thing. And so, you know, if you're subject to panic attacks that by minute eight, okay, I'm peaking, it's almost over. But if you're somebody who ends up carrying that panic attack around with you for an hour, it's just like an hour of this little bit less intense, but this really uncomfortable feeling. Either way, they are just a very, very uncomfortable feeling. So knowing that we have all these symptoms that come with our stress, and we want to be able to manage those feelings of anxiety and hopefully be able to maybe quiet our brain and manage these big feelings, it's important that we are aware of different types of treatment for them. And I'm also going to make sure we get some coping skills that we can take with us right away. So the first type, psychotherapy and counseling, which if we need that extra support, is so important. You want to find the therapist who is right for you. I say this to all of my clients, to people I run into on a day-to-day -day basis who ask about my work, to my family who's probably tired of hearing about it. But when you're searching for a therapist, you want to make sure that they fit you, that you feel like you're being heard. Not just, you know, oh, well, I have this friend who knows somebody and they said they had this great therapist. It's great to get recommendations and referrals, absolutely. But just with the idea that each person is individual, their experiences are individual. So you want the person who fits you just right. If you feel like they're not hearing you, if you feel like they're not getting it right, let them know. We're all professionals. We should all be able to adjust and be like, what can I do to make this fit right for you? And then if I cannot, let me provide you with the appropriate referral. It is absolutely okay. We should not you know, go to bed at night crying because a client wants somebody who fits them better because you are the priority. So with your therapist, things that you might do, you work together to reduce the symptoms of this anxiety. But that may be the overarching goal. You may explore your triggers. You may explore if you're catastrophizing, if you're engaging in negative self-talk. Where are these feelings coming from? Are they coming from a thought coming in my head? Are they coming from something that's happened to me? You're going to work on coping skills and you're going to possibly expose yourself to some of these anxieties to build your confidence in those situations. You may need to engage in some lifestyle changes and we'll get a little bit more into that later on where you explore the foods that you're having, because there are some foods that trigger anxiety versus other foods that do not, and that increase relaxation or promote relaxation. You wanna explore your activity levels and your sleep hygiene. Sleep has so much to do with how we feel. And of course, if needed, at some point, you may need to explore medication. And in which case you wanna, again, find a prescriber who is the right fit for you. They'll ask you all sorts of questions, 
about the feelings that you have, about the symptoms that you have, hopefully about the lifestyle that you're leading as well, so that they can find the right prescription for you to help reduce those symptoms of anxiety. This, the medication typically will work best in conjunction with counseling and lifestyle change. They, all of these definitely team up really well together where some can stand more on their own. Medication is one where it can be very helpful to have that therapeutic component in the beginning, whether you need it all the way through or whether you just need a month, a couple of months to work yourself up to have more of those coping skills. So our big question is now what? You've told me about it, where it comes from biologically, but how am I going to manage this? How am I going to manage this, especially if my stressors are ongoing, whether it's one thing or whether it's a lot of tiny things run right after the other that just are not giving me a break to manage these feelings. So I want you to take a moment and reflect and take a big breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. In your everyday life, what rises to the top of your brain right now and the top of your list in terms of what you need? Do you know what steps you need to take in order to address what you need? Is something you need emotional? Is it spiritual? Is it financial? Is it something you need to accomplish mentally, physically? And when you reflect on that, you may see that you've naturally prioritized things. And when you reflect on that, you may see that some things bring you more stress than others. And those may be the things we want to think about. How can we manage the feelings around this so I can get to the point where I can manage the actual situation? So the million dollar question here is how can I decrease my stress? Well, first we want to learn. We want to learn how to respond to the stress and to be able to recognize the signs that we are stressed. A little bit of already what we've talked about, the different symptoms. And we're going to take that learning and then practice it. So let's learn and practice our basic stress management skills, our anxiety management skills. And then we want to be able to recognize when do we apply these strategies and then engage in it and do it. Sometimes they'll work really fast. Sometimes it takes a little bit of practice. And then we wanna reflect on all of that and think, okay, am I at a point where this is manageable for me? Or am I at a point where maybe I need a little bit more support? So when we talk about stress and anxiety management, we have four basic categories. We have our relaxation techniques, cognitive techniques, behavioral awareness and changes, and relationship reviews. And I have them written out this way, but I actually go backwards because relation, uh, relaxation techniques are my favorite. And I find if I put them first, I'll end up talking way too much about them. <laughs> so we do go backwards. So we're going to start with relationships. When it comes to uncomfortable feelings, connection is the antidote to that discomfort. So we want to be able to find ways to connect. We know in the past couple of years, it's been a little bit harder to connect. We may have had times where we felt really isolated. And I don't want to ignore, you know, ignore that idea. So sometimes we have to find those alternative ways to connect. And we've been very lucky with the technology, whether it's we're able to connect with people through Zoom, through the tele telephone, through outdoor activities. And we are in a spot where we have been coming more back into being able to do things that we were able to do before, but we still want to keep our minds open to those alternative ideas. We need to be willing to compromise on some of those ideas at times. You know, if I... I'm very comfortable being indoors and talking to someone and my friend is not, maybe we find a different activity to do. Maybe we sit outside and we have you know, a lemonade or a tea or an adult beverage while we chat instead of being inside um, and instead of meeting on Zoom, this way we've found our protective bubble of compromise. You know, We're outside, the air is moving and we're still able to find that connection with each other. We want to be able to, in our relationships, to effectively communicate in an open and a respectful way. So if we know that these feelings of anxiety and these feelings of stress can lead us to feeling a little bit more agitated and a little bit more irritated, we can easily fall into some conflict. I tell my students often, emotionally, 
mm, we're all set like volcanoes, but our volcanoes are all at different levels and different things can make those levels go up. So if I'm having just a regular normal day and I'm feeling good and it's nice, well, maybe my volcano sit really low. And if I have a conflict or a disagreement with someone, my level just goes you know, up a little bit. But if I'm having a day where I woke up late and the weather is not the weather I like, or my allergies are really bad, or I got an uncomfortable phone call to, to deal with, and then I meet with someone and my level's set up here, and all of a sudden we have a little bit of a conflict, that might be the last thing on top of that volcano that makes it want to explode. So we want to be able to think of respectful and effective ways to communicate when we're feeling that agitated. And very often what we use um, are called I statements. I am feeling, I am feeling overwhelmed. I am feeling uncomfortable. I am feeling frustrated because people can't argue with how you feel. They can't tell you, no, you, you know what? You're happy today. You're not stressed. Well, no, I am stressed. Let's acknowledge it. And I'm now going to try my best to move along and have this great conversation with my friend who's here, even though we're disagreeing on something. We don't wanna let the resentment that we may feel from some of these conflicts build up inside, because again, that will set our volcano higher. And if we can just keep pushing our feelings down, then they explode out of us in not the most effective way. Now, does that happen to all of us at some point? Absolutely, absolutely. But we, if we're starting to feel like, hey, something's feeling a little bit bigger on me, Maybe I need to take one of these, these coping strategies that we went over and engage in it. Or maybe I need to remove myself from the situation and from this conversation for a minute and just pull my thoughts together before I say something that I really don't want to say. We also want to be able to work to forgive. We all make mistakes. And to be able to forgive can give us more space to manage different feelings, to give our mind more space and let it be something that's off of our mind. And as I said before, I want to really be able to communicate effectively and clarify what we need from our support group versus our expectations. Um, my husband and I <laughs> have conflict on this quite often. If one of us is has a problem or a frustration with something outside of our relationship, we look at it in two different ways. For me, I know I just want him to hear it and validate how I'm feeling he is very much, let me offer you solutions. And I sit there like, what are you doing? That's not what I want. You're not helping. And unfortunately, <laughs> flip the this, this script. And it is the same way. If I'm like, oh, wow, it sounds so frustrating. He's like, well, can't you give me something to help me solve this? So know what the other person is looking for when they're talking to you. <laughs> and also be able to set boundaries. You know, it's very important that we protect ourselves. If we are in a relationship where we feel like we're the one who's always giving the 70% or 80%, we might want to be setting a boundary on that and maybe step back a little bit. Relationships are very seldom 50-50. They can be 60-40, 30-70, but they should never be one way all the time. It should be fluctuating. Sometimes I'm going to need to be the 60 or 70, and sometimes you're going to need to be the 60 or 70%. We're also talking about behavioral. So our goal when it comes to this is to manage our interpersonal interactions and our distress symptoms. So our behavioral, behavioral techniques will encourage us to reflect on our assumptions and to share our expectations. So again, things that we've kind of said already in the relationship part, but because this incorporates our interpersonal interactions, we wanna make sure that we're still doing that. But then let's take down some of these behaviors and we want to set a routine. It may be very comforting to have in the morning. I know for myself, if I'm feeling very overwhelmed, if my anxiety has kicked up a little bit, one of the best things I can do at, in the morning is when I wake up, get my planner and write down like the three top things that I need to accomplish for the day. And that way, even if I don't, I know that there's that list there and it takes away some of the pressure to remember what I'm going to do. Another thing when we're talking about routine, we can think about setting out our meals, making sure we have time for our workout, if that's what we deem important, making sure we have time for our self-care, falling into that routine because it can be a comfort. We wanna make sure we get some exercise, even if it's just some light walking, even if it's like chair yoga, if we're finding that our bodies are not moving so well one day. We want to consume responsibly. So very often when it comes to feeling overwhelmed, when it comes to feeling anxious, 
there is that, that real idea of comfort food. What makes me feel better in the, mo the moment? And as I said before, for me, it's definitely carbs, but I do call bagels my gateway drug. They take me to harder things like cake and pasta. And then I feel awful and I feel full of sugar and my anxiety returns with a vengeance. So we want to think there is a very strong link between what we eat and being able to manage feelings of anxiety. So foods that increase anxiety, unfortunately, are usually all those wonderful things that we can turn to, like caffeine because it keeps me going and I love my coffee, or sugar because, I mean, come on, a donut makes you feel better so often, and alcohol. Foods that naturally decrease our feelings of anxiety are more clean eating. There are actual scientific links to things like peaches and turkey and herbal tea. So going from behavioral, we go into some of our cognitive techniques. And I just love this little chicken here. <laughs> so that's why the chicken is in, in this presentation, because it's okay to be tired, but don't feel guilty about it. You are not expected to have infinite energy. It is very important that for whatever reason, so many of us carry around a lot of guilt and shame about taking time for ourselves or giving ourselves forgiveness to do different things when it comes to feeling overwhelmed, when it comes to feeling anxious. So what we want to do when we're thinking about how we can manage our feelings of anxiety and stress cognitively, we want to think about the different attitudes and beliefs that we hold. Do we have some faulty cognitions in our brain? Are we thinking of things that maybe aren't 100% true? Do we talk to ourselves in a way that's really negative, beating ourselves up, telling ourselves that we can't succeed or that we're not any good at this, or you shouldn't be feeling this way. Oh, the shoulds, the shoulds come out and they are not very kind. Well, who's to say I shouldn't be feeling this way? Look at everything going on around me. It doesn't have to be something catastrophic that causes these feelings. We all have you know, a level of how much we can manage. And sometimes that level is too much and we need to be able to take that time for ourselves. And sometimes as wonderful as our brain is, we need to talk back to it and be like, hey, you're beating me up and this is not okay. We wanna be able to restructure our thinking. Something that I've seen a lot more recently is the idea of catastrophizing. I'm gonna be very honest, my family has made catastrophizing an art form. So when it comes to catastrophizing, we start someplace and we end up a thousand miles away, or we go zero to a hundred miles per hour immediately. So the biggest example that I've been giving recently is, you know, as many of us know that the students in school right now may be engaging in state testing. And what I hear is if I do poorly on the test, I will never get into college and my life will not be any good. And I sit there and I scratch my head a little bit and I'm like, you're in fifth grade. What do you mean? So that's, an example of catastrophizing, going to the worst possible case at that time. So no, like there's so many steps in between of, of what could happen. Maybe you don't do well on the test. And so you buckle down and study. Maybe you don't do well on the test and you get a tutor. Maybe you do amazing on the test and you realize that you prefer trade school. Maybe you do amazing on the test and you realize that the path you want to take on life is completely different. So not having this real black and white idea that if this happens, then I am at worst case scenario. If this doesn't happen, I'm at worst case scenario. Let's start thinking about instead the small steps to take to get to what our goal is instead of focusing on where that worst case scenario might be. We want to be able to set goals no matter how small they are. Sometimes what happens when we have goals is we think about that end goal and it looks like a giant mountain and that overwhelms us and it makes us feel really anxious. So we want to decide, try to break up the mountain, give us, get ourselves to base camp before we try to tackle that whole mountain. After base camp, where's, where's that first, I'm not up on my mountain nearing, I don't know if that's a word, vocabulary, where, what comes after base camp? Where are the different spots that we can stop in climbing up our mountain? or to our goal. So let's set small goals, not, you know, that will lead us to a bigger goal, but not just focusing on that end goal. One of my favorites, utilizing visualization and positive imagery. I think this is just 
so important. And honestly, it goes back to high school tennis. My tennis coach used to talk all the time about basketball and he used to cite this study of basketball players on a team that were divided in two. And half of them had to take a hundred free throw shots every day after practice. And half of them had to visualize those hundred free throw shots every day after practice instead of actually taking them. And when it came time to see who had the bigger percentage of basket making for those free throws, it was the team that did the visualization. When it comes to that visualization though, we and we want it to work. We really need to think of all the small details in it. How would it feel? What does it smell like? Is there something to touch? Even if that visualization is not necessarily about going after our goal, but we're using it for a self-care moment or a five minute vacation. Okay, I'm going to take a big breath. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to visualize myself on the beach. How am I going to feel it? What does it smell like? What's the weather like? What am I hearing? We want to be able to rehearse mentally. So maybe there is an event coming up and we need to speak at it. Maybe there is an event coming up and I want it set up in a certain way or I want the day to go in a certain way. I can think it through and think, what will it be like? And again, it sounds very similar to visualization because it is. And then scheduling, you know, schedule time for the self-care. Sometimes schedule time to worry. If those worries are keeping you up at night, you can be like, okay, I'm gonna put 10 minutes in my phone and this is going to be my worry thinking time. And I'm going to think through all my worries. Now, we do get to move on to my favorite, <laughs> mindfulness and relaxation. Um, I am very well aware that for many people, the idea of mindfulness can sound a little bit cliched. Um, I call it the therapeutic version of kale where many years ago, well, not many, kale was seen as like, the wonder food that fixes everything. <laughs> I often think mindfulness is a term that may be overused, but there is definite benefits to it. So when it comes to those feelings of being overwhelmed and being anxious, this is a great way to calm or quiet our mind. So the first one is therapeutic breathing. And when I teach this to young children, I teach it as a triangle. We breathe in through our nose for three, we hold it for three, we breathe out for three, and we do it a set of three times. Easy to remember because it's threes. But there are so many other ways that we can engage in this therapeutic breathing. The big one for adults is actually a little bit tricky. We breathe in through our nose for five, we hold it for seven, and we breathe out slowly for eight through our mouth. Now, if you've ever taken in a breath for five, hold it for seven and breathe out for eight, um, that's really difficult to do <laughs> because you really have to pace your breath and it does take practice. And I do laugh and just about everybody laughs at me when I talk about therapeutic breathing because they're like, wait, breathing? That is something that simple? Well, yes, if you're really filling your lungs up and taking that time to concentrate on your breath, you're getting yourself back into your body. But the breathing part of it and slowing your breathing down like that sends a message to your brain. Your brain then stimulates your parasympathetic nervous system and all those calming chemicals come out. Um, back to panic attacks, this is one of the best ways, if you can feel the symptoms coming on, to start the therapeutic breathing. One of the best ways you can either decrease the intensity or stop that panic attack cold. So thinking really deep breaths. Another way, if those numbers don't work for you, you can use some visualization going back to that cognitive idea and think about, I tell the little kids to think about hot cocoa, but you can also think about flowers and like I'm breathing in that beautiful scent of the flower and I'm going to try to blow all the petals off. Basically anything that can get you into deep breathing deeper down into your lungs. The other thing to know about breathing is that you have to practice it, which sounds really silly. I'm sure none of us were on a breathing team growing up. In fact, I would challenge anyone to find an actual breathing team. But it's really important to practice because when we're in that state where we're anxious and our body is just really picking up those stress symptoms physically, and we think, I got this, I've got the therapeutic breathing down, our brain says no. So you have to practice it 
quite a bit first. I always tell people just do two or three rounds before bed. If anything, it's going to lull you into a really nice sleep. And then you've gotten your breathing practice down and then your body will naturally fall into it when those stress and panic symptoms increase. And it'll be like, oh wait, no, I know this breathing, I can do it. Meditation is our next one. People either love it or hate it. And that's absolutely okay. Because sometimes if we're feeling really anxious, it can make our mind spin. For something like that, I would suggest a guided meditation. There are fantastic apps for them right now. Calm, Headspace. Jason Stevenson on YouTube is probably one of my favorites. Um, he just has a really, really pleasant sounding voice and accent, and he does great meditations. Musical, if you don't like hearing words. Um, doodle, if you feel like you can't stop moving. A doodle meditation where you listen to music and you just doodle on some paper is great. Any type of grounding technique. So this is really imploring our five senses. So thinking of five things that we can see, really describing them to yourself as you're seeing them. Four things that we can touch. What's the texture feel like? Is it soft? Is it hard? Again, really taking that description. Three things that we can hear, two things we can smell, and one thing we can taste. It gets you out of your mind and into your body, really with those senses. If you feel like, I don't have time for that, wow, that could take some time. And you might need all that time. There is a cheat sheet version, a Hershey's Kiss, a Jolly Rancher, a Lollipop. I always go to the Hershey's Kiss because I like chocolate. I can look at it, it's shiny, I can touch it, it feels like crinkly. I can open it and hear the paper open because it's a crinkly noise. I can smell the delicious chocolate smell. I can drop the Hershey Kiss on my tongue and let it sit there and taste all the different flavors of cocoa. Progressive muscle relaxation is another great one. Also, if you're finding trouble sleeping, it's fantastic. You tense your muscles starting from your toes, working up through your muscle groups, all the way up to your body and all the way back down. This is great if you feel like when you have a lot of anxiety that your skeleton wants to like jump out of your body. It is a great way to relax the body. Basically anything that's going to bring you into the moment, out of your mind and into your body. So mind body connection exercises like yoga are fantastic, but I also would never rule out the idea of kickboxing, something that you're doing like physically to again, get you a little more out of your mind and more into your body. So some other things that you can do if you're in the middle of a panic or an anxiety attack, as we said, the breathing, four, seven, eight, you can breathe the rainbow, thinking of the colors, breathing a figure eight, going, breathing in through your nose. And when you get to the center of the eight, pausing. And then when you come up the other side, breathe out, then pause, breathe in. Any type of muscle relaxation, tapping, I'm a big one for this. Um, so if you see like the pincher grip, that's how you start. And then you just bounce your fingers off of each other, slowly back and forth. That brings you into your body again, takes a little bit of um, the feelings that you're feeling just relaxes them, frees up a little bit of brain space. As we said before, breaking up the mountain, the five senses grounding, take a break. You can just take a walk outside, take a break. Journal it. Journaling doesn't have to be your diary. Today I felt stressed. It can just be one word written in a color, however you feel. Some people really love the idea of bullet journaling where they really do like all the different aesthetic and colors. Um, <laughs> popping bubbles, I didn't take that out. <laughs> that was for any children. <laughs> Talking out loud to our brain is so important. Giving ourselves a pep talk. Maybe when we're feeling not stressed, writing ourselves a letter telling us how great we are, putting it away for a time when we do feel stressed. And of course, connecting with a friend and talking about our feelings. So I always like to say self-care is how we take our power back. And in the interest of time, please excuse how fast I'm going to talk. <laughs> but what is self-care? Well, it involves these three things, self-awareness, balance, and connection. So the awareness is an awareness of what our needs are, what our limitations are, our boundaries. Do we have to maybe set more boundaries? Do we need to stick to our boundaries? Do we, do we know when to say no? What about our energy levels? We need to be aware. Am I tired? Am I feeling hungry? Am I feeling overloaded? How can I take some of that and bring myself back a little bit to base level? And of course, an awareness of our emotions. Am I feeling anxious? Am I feeling sad, lonely, frustrated? And we wanna use that awareness to self-monitor and pace ourselves that balance, finding our balance, implementing boundaries, knowing when to say no to others, delegating if we need to, knowing it's okay and not to feel guilty if we need to ask for help, maybe finding some time in silence so that we can read or write or meditate 
or whatever it is that speaks to us that we want more time to find time just for us. It could just be going outside in nature and taking a walk by ourselves, limiting caffeine and alcohol, and of course, getting enough sleep. As we were saying before, the connection is so important. We want our support circle because they provide us with that powerful stress reliever. We don't want to compare, okay, my stress and your stress are not the same. So let's not compare the two, but let's be there and be present and help each other manage it. Maybe we need to schedule an event session or a problem solving session and let those expectations be clear. Do I wanna be heard and my feelings validated or do I want you to give me solutions, possible solutions to help me with this? Of course, make time to have fun with your friends, with your children, with your grandchildren, with your family. And if extreme stress persists, get support. So strategies you might already be doing, including noticing, all the beauty around you, especially at this time of year, as everything is allergy inducing. Wait, no, that's wrong. As everything is green and flowery and beautiful, sing at the top of your lungs, in the car, in the shower, watch something really, really funny and have a really good belly laugh, whether it's one time a week or one time a day, aromatherapy, surround yourself in things you like to smell, making a gratitude list, no matter how small it is, maybe finding time each day to write one or three or five things that you're grateful for. And it may just be, this morning I was grateful for this really good cup of coffee and that's okay. Journaling, coloring, we know there's a million adult coloring books out there now, practicing mindfulness. So meditating through nature, through food, hugging or spending time with our animals and spending time in nature. So self-care is the taking care of yourself, and it's the most powerful way to begin to take care of others. So after hearing all this, how do I know if I need to seek more support? Well, if after a few weeks you're experiencing these feelings and symptoms of anxiety more often than not, it may be a good time to explore finding more support. If you find that you're having more frequent or serious emotional outbursts and difficulty recovering, now remember an outburst is not just like an emotional meltdown or yelling at someone. It can just, it can be like a panic attack. It can be sitting for an hour feeling just hypervigilant and not necessarily a panic attack, but knowing something that's really uncomfortable. It doesn't have to be a giant thing where you're like, oh, it's like a tantrum. No, it can just be like, all my emotions are bubbling up. And if you're feeling and symptoms of anxiety are starting to interrupt your everyday functioning, then it's definitely time to find some support. I always like to throw the resources in. I think it's really, really important. If, of course, if you ever think it's an emergency, please call 911. I put this up there. I know they put it on movies because people forget in the movies, but people do forget in real life because when you're in some type of crisis, it's hard to think of anything clearly at that time. Bergen County Crisis has, Bergen County in general has fantastic resources. So you have Bergen County Crisis, 201262 Help. I have the children's resources up here again, because I always think it's better the more information of the crisis resources we can give out. There is a text line for people who don't like to make calls, 741-741. I think it is so important to know that the first two responses, are, and I spelled two wrong, I apologize, are automated. I can't think of anything more frustrating than reaching out for help and getting a robot answering you. So no, it's only the first two responses. For children 10 to 24, um, second floor is a fantastic resource. Now, what if I want treatment? Again, Bergen County has a fantastic array of agencies for treatment. Obviously, I'm partial to West Bergen. <laughs> um, you can look through your insurance or you can call different agencies directly. If you have any questions that I don't get to answer, please feel free to reach out. Here is my email, bkrug at westbergen.org. And my number is 201-444-3550, extension 7586. We also have a lot of information on our website, which is www.westbergen.org. And if you're looking for services, you can call our access center. Esther is amazing. And that number is 201-688-7098, and they will get you set up and give you all the information you need, including verifying your insurance so there's no surprise costs at all. And of course, I am the daughter of a teacher, so I can include my work cited in case you want any extra information. I am going to stop my share now, and I would love to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was excellent information. Um, we do have questions coming in. 
I'd like to remind people, if you do have questions, please enter them into the Q&A um, uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so uh, just the first one is, um, what was the YouTube meditation speaker you made reference to? Jason Stevenson, I worked in a rehab right out of grad school. And so it was for a traumatic brain injury and substance and addiction. And we ran a meditation and mindfulness group and everybody loved Jason Stevenson the best. Hey, I'm going to write that down into the chat awesome. so people know. How's that? Awesome. And Stevenson, S-T-E-P-H, I believe. He's fantastic. He also has, you know, again, always trying to send more information out. He does have ones that are specific for whatever you're feeling, but also if there are children involved, he has ones where he tells stories um, and they're delightful. Great. And how many repetitions of therapeutic breathing? I always say start with three and see how you feel after that. And then increase in three is just because three is an easy number to remember. And since I always start off by teaching the triangle, it comes back to that idea. Great. Um, so if people do have questions, we'll give it a moment. Um, um, okay. I just found his website, Stevenson. Our heart, you can do that. Sorry. our heart fluctuations part of anxiety. Absolutely. Um, I, and I'm going to speak personally from that. I was terrified, terrified the first time I had a panic attack because I thought my heart was going to fly out of my chest. Now it is still important to get checked out. I got checked out by a cardiologist simply because there is a history of tachycardia in my family. And, you know, if you have that history or if you have an AFib history, you want to make sure that that's checked out and that there's nothing else going on, but it can be anything from your heart speeding up. And this is what I find interesting. Like if you think about a workout, your heart can go so much faster, right? But it feels almost like a different speeding up, even though it might be within the same range as a workout. Um, I have found the breathing really, really helps with that at first like I would stop and panic and that would make it worse. Um, and after that, like I breathe, I can get up and I can do chores around the house. Cause for me, it happens at night. Um, I think it's a response to stress eating sometimes, but it also can feel, so it can feel like it just speeds up. It can feel like it's hammering, like it's coming out of your chest, like the heart tune, the cartoon character. And it can also feel like a flutter. Okay. Um, there are a, a few references um, to the recording of this session. Um, the session is being recorded. It usually takes us a couple of days just to edit out any information or and to get it posted. Um, we don't send out a notice for it. Um, however, it will be at um, on Valley's website at valleyhealth.com and um, backslash tune into health. And that has the list of, of all the programs. Um, so this program will be there. Um, someone is asking for a printout of your PowerPoint to refer back to. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if you just wanna to refer to the recording or if that's something that you would like to address. I'm more than happy to, to share whatever I have, of course. So if you want to email me, that was on, on my last slide or the second to last slide, I'd be happy to send it, of course. Oh, I put that information into the chat. Let's see. Um, if you want, you can actually direct it to me and I'm happy to get it from Barbara. Is that easier for you, Barbara Krug? Whatever works, of course. All right, I'll, I'll put yours. B K R U G at West Bergen. I'm, I'm not seeing, oh, there we go, okay. I see the um, Barbara Hand, I see the, the email. Um, I don't see the, the YouTube person. I put it under Jason Stevenson. Okay. That's, I just put that one in. Oh, okay. And it's also with Barbara Krug's. It's the last entry in the chat. Great. Okay. Um, 
There is a comment that one participant made about um, being at the mercy of health issues. And um, feeling helpless because of it. That's an uncomfortable feeling, of course. So I think in, in these instances, to try to refocus on what we can control, which, which can be very difficult because it can still be scary. Um, but is there is there a small place where we can start to figure out what we can control in this and then the idea of the mindfulness and pulling yourself into the moment what do i want to get from this moment what do i want to do and be able to try to do to the fullest i know when it comes to things like exercise that can be really difficult um or anything where it's getting into your body but there are some difficult uh, difficult no i'm sorry <laughs> there are some Fantastic. Again, on YouTube, um, I used this a lot when I was at the rehab because a lot of my clientele was quadriplegic, paraplegic. Um, the meditations, of course, there's chair Zumba, chair yoga, um, chair, chair kickboxing, believe it or not, <coughs> you find all of that. And then of course, anything for re the relaxation, whether it's the progressive muscle relaxation, the visualization of what do I want to be able to do to go out and do? Is there a way I can get out into nature? Um, because it, it can be hard and what can we control in this moment? You know, I'll also say, I have a friend who, um, recently, uh, had some, some health issues that meant she was really to some degree, um, isolated in her home. And she found, um, some wonderful online bridge program. She happens to be somebody who likes to play bridge. So she plays bridge online and she's developed a community of friends that way, which helps her with her thought process, her anxiety keeps her occupied, does the connection issues that you spoke about before, um, Barbara. I, I know someone else who plays chess online. So there may be things that you can explore um, that are interesting. Is I personally, during the pandemic, took online art classes. I've never written, driven, uh, done a thing in my life. I, I always thought I was terrible at drawing. But um, I did it. I found you can find a teacher online and and do online art classes. And I found that to be incredibly therapeutic. So I think that there's lots of things you can um, think about to do if your health precludes you from actually being more active outside your home. Just just a thought. And there are a lot of online support groups as well. Again, that connection component does become so, so important. Um. Could Mrs. Krug briefly give us a quick overview of her background and training? Oh, absolutely. Um, so I became a therapist in not the most orthodox way, I don't think. Uh, I wanted to be my senior year of high school. I mentioned it to my track coach who I allowed to talk me out of it. And so I decided I was going to be a sports broadcaster. I should be broadcasting for the Rangers, except I was not a professional athlete and I didn't really have the follow through to go into sports broadcasting. So I went to school for communication and marketing. And it was fantastic and wonderful. And I was producing our news program and senior year of college, 9-11 happened. So we did a lot of, a lot of coverage. And I just remember the head of the department being like, okay, at some point we have to turn off our emotions and thinking to myself, well, I, I'm an emotional person, what do you mean? So I got into therapeutic horseback riding because I was volunteering at a horse farm at the time. I became a therapeutic horseback riding instructor so I was the horse person um, when it came to like, I knew about CP and some physical disabilities and I could work with that. But what I found happening, children and adults were opening up to me on the horse. And I was like, oh, I'm not quite sure how to respond. I definitely need more education on this. So I did the only natural thing possible. I be went into restaurant management and <laughs> I managed a restaurant. I at that point, started fooling around with the idea of grad school. I ended up at William Patterson in their Master of Education program because I ended up working as a phys ed teacher after being in restaurant management. Um, and I just found that that William Patterson Master of Education and Professional Counseling program was like home. It was fantastic. So through them, I 
specialized in clinical mental health counseling. I also did field work as a school counselor and graduated from them and worked in a rehab in Livingston, as I said before, for traumatic brain injury and addiction. And then I found myself back at the school I had been working at as their school counselor. And from there found West Bergen was hiring for clients. And I just think timing was everything. I got hired as a per client. Within a couple of months, I was hired on as a staff therapist and then a school-based clinician program um, position opened and I went into school-based. So I split my time now between a, a school district and the outpatient caseload, as well as doing community programming, which I love because I just, I feel like it brings me full circle back to what I started with and where I wanted to go in high school and just bringing it all together. I'm so happy that your path has led you to West Bergen and that you do enjoy community education because this program was phenomenal. Um, I appreciate you stepping in for, for Michael um, and for sharing these great resources and the wonderful information. 